overview of all these mathematical approaches. Um, also, it would be negligent of me not to mention that, of course, physicists have been thinking about QFT for decades and uh, that they developed a massive amount of tools to approach quantum field theories, to understand them, to try and uh, solve them, to, to gain an insight into their physics and so on. One might call that traditional QFT in quote marks. Uh, you can just find your favorite quantum field theory textbook. This is not my favorite, but this is the one that I end up using when I'm teaching the subject. Also, lattice QFT is, a, is another approach which has been highly successful in interpreting quantum field theory. And finally, another new strand coming from physics in understanding quantum field theories comes from the tensor network community, where recently we've been trying to take ideas from tensor networks into condensed matter theory to actually understand quantum field theories themselves. So there's a lot of, I, I wanted to specifically name these sources um, because they, they, they actually influence um, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about later. Um, perhaps the most important result uh, to my mind in this narrative of taking a quantum field theory uh, and putting in something and then getting something out, like solving it, comes from this, this res recent result from Lattice uh, QFT. They took uh, a large chunk of the standard model. They input some data that they found from experiment, namely the masses of the pi k, k mesons and so on. And then they turned the handle with a, a massive amount of computing power and they numerically obtained predictions for the masses of other hadrons and mesons. So this is kind of an amazing result, right? You've taken this fundamental theory, you've put it in some experimentally obtained data, and now you're getting out predictions that match the experiment. So in a sense, we're done, right? You know, we, we've taken our model of the universe and we solved it and yeah, we've made some predictions and they've been matched. So we understand the universe, right? Well, I would argue that may, maybe that's not quite, quite uh, the, uh, the, the state of affairs. And we might not quite be satisfied with the state of affairs. So what I, I think the take home message from this is that the statics of quantum field theory can sort of be easily simulated. So you've got to really understand that with scare quotes, right? You know, the lattices that we can cope with with these lattice computations is 10,000, well, let's say 100 by 100 by 100 by 100 is the kinds of lattices that they look at. There's hardly the size of the universe. It's just enough to contain like a proton. And, um, but nonetheless, if, we, if we're generous, we might say that, you know, the kinematics or statics of quantum field theories have, well, thanks to lattice QFT, the tools of lattice QFT have actually uh, led to the easy simulation uh, of, of these properties. But there's something glaringly open, and that is the dynamics of quantum field theory. So the fact that I'm here talking to you means that time is passing, and time passing means that dynamics is taking place. We really want to understand the dynamics of our physical systems, particularly with regard to quantum computers, where indeed a dynamical process such as a quantum circuit uh, doesn't make hardly any sense in a static setting. And there we have a problem. So the dynamics of most quantum systems is classically hard to simulate. And you know one of the uh, one of the kind of symptoms of this is the so-called sign problem when you use Monte Carlo sampling to simulate these 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 processes. And uh, when faced with that, you might give up or, or, or whatever, but actually um, maybe not, right? You know, we also live in an extraordinary era, namely the quantum information era, right? You know, so large scale quantum information processing devices are coming online uh, uh, at a, an extraordinary pace. And we are be we're getting access for the very first time to large coherent entangled quantum systems whose dynamics we're allowed to engineer. And so that leads us to uh, the idea of using quantum simulation with our quantum computers to actually uh, approach these complex quantum systems that quantum field theories present and perhaps evade this sign problem. So indeed that's true, right? The quantum simulation just simply evades this, this well-known sign problem and allows us to simulate the temporal dynamics of large complex quantum systems. And it's on this backdrop that I really wanna you know, take um, aim again at, at, at quantum field theory. So uh, there has been indeed quite a lot of prior work on using quantum simulation to understand uh, quantum field theory. Uh, I mentioned here several key results uh, that, that were highly influential to me, certainly. Uh, the first result that I found particularly attractive was that of Tim Burns and Yamamoto um, back in 2006. They simulated gauge theories already, or they presented a quantum simulation algorithm for gauge theories. And also in the meantime, lots of gauge-like theories known as link models and, and, and other such models have been, uh, have been uh, well, proposals to simulate them using analog quantum simulation have been made. Uh, 
there is a, a however perhaps most important for this talk is the key result of, of Jordan Lee and Preskill in 2012, where they presented the first legitimate digital quantum simulation of a uh, interacting quantum field theory, namely phi four theory. And since then, that, that result's been taken further and, and been developed and continues to be developed these days. So this is sort of key results that, that are in the background of this talk and uh, certainly a huge inspiration uh, for everything I'm gonna tell you today. But I'm also, I, I have to make my apologies to the authors of all these papers because I'm gonna do them a, a very considerable injustice and uh, explain why I don't think um, they've solved everything. Uh, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, and by, but um, you know, don't let that uh, diminish. I don't want that to diminish the, their contributions. I mean, these results were truly uh, exciting and well deserve a place in, in this, this uh, history here. So now that we've sort of got, gotten through the why part of my talk, you know, why simulate quantum field theories, um, let's start getting into the, to, to the, the how and the what. So I want to get to the question of what, what, what does it even mean to simulate a quantum field theory? So I'm going to get to telling you what a quantum field theory is, don't worry. Um, in, fact, in fact, most of the talk will be doing that. Um, but I do want to give you a sense of um, what it means to simulate a QFT before I even tell you what a QFT is. So you might be happy if you can identify the masses of the particles. And that's certainly what the lattice QFT uh, practitioners have been involved in doing. Uh, I would argue that that's sort of more the static properties of the theory and you're missing quite a lot of the dynamics, the richness of the theory. So you might say, well, we want to reproduce some correlators, the temporal correlation functions, maybe a bit stronger. Maybe you want to produce a, 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 so an approximation to the ground state stored as a quantum state in a quantum computer, for example. Or maybe you want to approximate the S matrix, which will tell you, roughly speaking, the, the long time dynamics of the system. You know, the, when you trace, you, you trace out the intermediate times of, a, of, a, of an interaction process. Um, but then there's something even stronger. And, and in fact, I'm going to argue this is, this is the strongest way to interpret the expression, what does it mean to simulate a QFT? And I'm going to dwell on this question for the rest of the talk. And that is, I would claim that the, the strongest interpretation of what it means to simulate a QFT is that you simulate the full action of the Poincaré group um, or the conformal group, as it depends, um, with error bounds. So that's, that, that goes well beyond these other uh, goals that I listed before. Um, and it also throws up enormous challenges. So I'm going to explain very pictorially what I might mean, what one might interpret uh, by the statement to simulate the Poincaré group with error bounds. And then I'll dive right into like, how are we going to, how do we even approach this problem? Okay, so what I think when I hear the words simulate the Poincaré group with error bounds is I think, okay, I take my favorite boost or translation or rotation, and I demand that I can write down a quantum circuit that approximately simulates the action of that boost translation rotation on some stored quantum state in the quantum simulation device. Now, I, I just want to emphasize that the Poincaré group contains translations in space, but also in time. So simulating the Poincaré group is as hard as uh, simulating just the temporal dynamics according to the Schrodinger equation. But of course, it's much harder, right? You're demanding that you can also simulate boosts and rotations and translations. So this is like one possible interpretation of what one might mean by to simulate the action of the full Poincaré group, to produce a quantum circuit on a stored digital uh, copy a uh, digital representation of the quantum field state. And then to give some error bounds, like to say, oh, okay, this simulation worked and it worked with this error. And that brings us to this statement, like simulating quantum field theory with error bounds, like what, what might we need to do that? And I would argue, and I hope it's not too controversial that we're probably gonna need this. We're probably gonna need a mathematically rigorous formulation of quantum field theory. Because you, know, you wanna compare something with something. And ultimately, that means you probably want to understand at a mathematically rigor rigorous level the, the, the things you're comparing. And one of the things is a discrete approximation, and the other delivered by a quantum simulator. And on the other hand, the quantum field theory itself. So we, we're probably going to need a mathematically rigorous QFT. Now, this is uh, it's more of a comment than a question. I don't yep. you're rude, but I think you've run a good, very good point that's applicable to basically all of physics. Not right. just QFT, and I think right. this, okay, yeah. physicists don't appreciate. You can't just hand wave around 
now that you want to actually run something like an engineer. That's all. I, I naturally you're I, you're pushing an open door with me with that comment. Um, I totally agree. Uh, uh, I would. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, one could we could replace QFT with like any physical system. I think on this slide. Um, and uh, and that's certainly the agenda I have today. Uh, so one, one comment I might make is that, you know, I see the situation we're in now is kind of like at the birth of quantum numerical analysis. Like if you study numerical analysis now, like you have your favorite elliptic PDE, then it's well understood both sides of a simulation uh, problem. It's the, the elliptic PDE's existence uniqueness is understood and the, the numerical methods are understood and we can rigorously approximate one with the other. And that doesn't stop physics or numerical analysis altogether. On the contrary, that opens the door for numerical analysis. So I guess in this talk, I'm broadly advocating for the inception of a kind of quantum numerical analysis that mirrors the, you know, the well-developed numerical analysis textbooks that we have already. So, you know, it's not to, to downplay the difficulty of this problem. It is notoriously difficult. You know, the greatest minds have failed at creating mathematically rigorous formulations of QFTs. Let's not beat about the bush. Um, it's the subject of one of the clay math millennium problems uh, well, in part. Uh, for one, just one uh, quantum field theory, the Union Mills theory. Uh, so, you know, what hope do we have? Should, why should, am I, I, A, either so arrogant, I think I can solve this problem, or B, um, so uh, naive to think that uh, one can make progress on, on such a thing without solving it? Well, no, neither. But because I, what I want to argue today is that the problem is notoriously difficult, but probably not for the reasons you might think. And th there, there, I think we have hope. Uh, we have hope to, to say things about quantum simulation without presenting a proof of the clay math millennial problems. And that's, that's, the, that, that's the objective today, to make systematic, simple progress on this problem without uh, getting completely lost in the quagmire of solving this extraordinarily challenging and important mathematical problem, but still yet presenting useful uh, approaches to these, these difficult systems. So what I'm going to do now is dive straight into uh, how you should think about quantum fields. And uh, this, this, is, this part of the talk is informed by probably a 10 year journey, 15 year journey that I've been on. Uh, firstly, learning quantum field theory, both uh, the physicist way and the mathematics way, uh, being in touch with these communities. So I, I'm regularly in touch with the mathematics community, the algebraic QFT side, the, the operator algebra community. And I'm also in touch with the physicist community to, to really make sure to, to check my understanding that, that indeed I think I'm saying correct things and that they would agree with them. And uh, it's also uh, based on some sort of new, new realizations that I, I think we're just beginning to make um, in these communities. So I'm going to start off, kick off by talking about kinematics, which is what possible, what are the states of a quantum field? What does it mean, state of a quantum field? And I'm going to try and give you the, the most concrete, simple down to earth definition that is possible and that is consistent with people's understandings in the physicist and mathematical community. So at the heart, I'm gonna try and answer the question of how is possible to compare the state of some weird continuous quantum field thing with something discrete, which we might understand better. And that's, that's how uh, uh, an understanding answer to this question is pretty much, pretty much gonna be the contribution to the first part of this talk. So the first thing I want to bring to your attention is an extraordinary understanding of quantum field theory that came in the late 70s or the mid 70s. Uh, before the mid 70s, people understood quantum field theory differently to how they understand it after the mid 70s. And this is thanks to Ken Wilson, who introduced the following characterization of quantum field theories. And I'm going to, uh, this is my distillate of this long article and his writings on the topic. Uh, it's very important that, that we dwell on this statement for a bit because it informs everything else that comes later. So in the Wilsonian picture of quantum field theory, we understand a quantum field theory as, a, a, as adjusting a regulated theory by increasing a cutoff while preserving low energy predictions. That's how you should think of quantum field theory in the Wilsonian point of view. And now it's, uh, it's important for me to explain these words to you. I have to say, what is regulated theory? What is cutoff and what is low energy predictions to even make sense of this, this statement? But I wanted to, to really bring it to your attention that Wilson introduced this way of understanding quantum fields. Physicists now routinely understand quantum fields this way. And also 
I, I want to make an interesting comment about the sort of the, the social, the, the, the history of the topic. I think the mathematical community that was focused heavily on creating rigorous um, formulations of quantum field theory have a pre-Wilsonian bias. And so they spend a lot of energy on uh, making quantum field theory rigorous using input from the physics community pre-Wilson. So a post-Wilsonian attack on mathematically making quantum field theory precise hasn't really begun in earnest, I would argue. But that's, that's one, one observation I'd like to make. So let me explain some words. What do we mean by regulated theory? Well, from now on, um, you can hereby interpret the sentence regulated theory, or the statement regulated theory as a lattice model. So I mean that in the sense of a quantum spin system. I, in, in a little bit, I'll actually give you a, a, the matrix when I talk to you about the matrix. A lattice model, there's some lattice spacing epsilon, and that's, that's key to defining the regulated theory. Epsilon is called the cutoff. And what do we mean by taking, um, uh, Let's go back to the statement, adjusting a regulated theory by increasing a cutoff. Well, increasing a cutoff is decreasing a lattice spacing. That means taking somehow a scaling or continuous limit, right? And what does that mean? Well, it means we fix some large scale correlation functions. Those are these low energy predictions. Low energy predictions means large scale correlation function. And we let the lattice spacing go to zero. And so in order for that to work out, you would need that the lattice correlation length goes to infinity. So whatever lattice system you have that's implementing this Wilsonian definition of a quantum field theory, it has to exhibit these properties that as you let the lattice, that the lattice correlation length goes to infinity as you change some parameters. And that's the signal or signature of something called a second order quantum phase transition. So you should already take home a physics message, and that is that you should understand quantum field theories, roughly speaking, as second order quantum phase transitions or synonymous with these things. I'm going to make this a lot more precise. Don't worry. This is this woolly statement uh, won't, won't stay. Uh, and at this point, I want to mention something called effective QFT, which is the way that uh, Preskill and collaborators approach the task of simulating quantum field theory. Uh, the idea of effective quantum field theory is you pick epsilon as small as you can. So you have a lattice theory that's meant to approximate a quantum field theory. And then you, you understand this resulting regulated theory as being in some sequence, a convergent sequence, as I'll argue. Uh, the question is, which one? Well, it's, it's going to be approximating some quantum field theory. So uh, you, you say, OK, I'm, I have simulated a quantum field theory. Uh, which one? Well, the, another extraordinary result of Wilson is that uh, there aren't that many quantum field theories that result. Uh, this is the, the concept of universality when you let the lattice spacing go to zero. Uh, so you can kind of make a good argument for which continuum theory you are approximating with a given lattice theory. And that's, that's the strategy employed in many quantum simulation results on quantum field theory today. You pick epsilon as small as you can, but it's fixed. You don't let epsilon change after that moment. And then you argue that you are really, in reality, approximating some quantum field theory, and you can make a good argument to which one. Now, uh, that's sort of the status of things, let's say, of about from 2000 on, you know, before 2000, maybe 2010. In the meantime, some, some really interesting developments have taken place in the mathematical literature. So there's a small but growing community of mathematicians who have taken seriously uh, the, the message of Wilson, and they're trying to implement it to actually develop rigorous formulations of quantum field theory. And this comes under the rubric of what you might call operator algebraic denormalization. That's what people have started to call this, this thing. And I'll explain that uh, in the next, the next slides. So this work has a bit of a prehistory. I think one of the key papers is from Zinni and Wang uh, 2017, that certainly they had most of the ideas there already sort of written out crystal clear in their paper, although the paper is long and challenging to read. Um, I, I also contributed to this uh, narrative with some work on continuum limits of lattice theories, but uh, it began in earnest, I think, with the work of, of, of um, Arnaud and Alex Stockmeister, who worked on the first full-blown rigorous formulation of Wilsonian um, QFT. And there's there from there follows on a, a list of papers where we this community has started to get engaged with this this formulation, and indeed there's quite a lot of results to come. Actually, there's I'm aware of. of of a fair number of results that, that will be emerging in the next couple of years. Now we can get to the nuts and bolts of this stuff. So now, now I can, I'm going to start to give you some concrete, precise, rigorous 
definitions with which we can work with. So let's start with the terminology regulated lattice theory. So I'm going to think about, to, do, to make this concrete, we'll think about a quantum system defined on a ring. This quantum system is broken up into little cells or you know, lattice units of length epsilon. And to each cell, we associate a, a d-dimensional quantum system, a qubit. And um, in order to make the pictures easier to draw, I'll just unwrap the circle on, on a line. The, the, the circle has a physical uh, circumference of L, L being epsilon times N in the number of lattice spacings. So the natural Hilbert space to associate with the system is just the tensor product of C to the D N times, N being the number of lattice space, uh, units. Uh, so that's the kinematics for a regulated theory. So uh, that's how we'll think about it for the rest of this talk. You can also do fermionic versions and bosonic versions. Um, we don't need to. Um, this already captures quite a lot of interest in systems. And now kinematics is all well and good, but you always need dynamics to breathe life into quantum mechanics. And for <laughs> dynamics, we need a generator of time translations. And here we'll introduce a Hamiltonian uh, to, to this right. regulated. Yep. Uh, it sounds like you're assuming some sort of compactness because your, your local Hilbert spaces are finite. Is that is, yeah? Can you talk your way around that? Uh, you, you, you're, you're wondering, it looks like space is compact here. L is um, no, I'm so, so I'm thinking in particular about U1, where like oh, U1 gauge theories and so on. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, you, you can certainly deal with them as well. There's no, no difficulties in going to U1 gauge theories or in compact gauge groups. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say we can go to uncompact gauge groups, that's that's definitely too far away at the present time. Um, there is natural generalizations of everything I say to, to, to gauge theories, um, to fermionic theories, and to bosonic theories. So I'm not really assuming that this is really for the, the purposes of simplifying the presentation rather than uh, being it built into the. the, the okay. Problem. But D is finite. So you need to take D infinity. Yeah, that's quite possible. We could certainly associate to each lattice cell an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. There's no real fundamental reason not to do that. Okay, yeah. Um, and in fact, in some of these papers here, they do do that. In fact, I think it's the, the 2019 paper. Yeah, Bautier, Arnold Bautier and Schottmeister, they already talked about gauge theory. Yeah. Um, I'm simplifying the presentation considerably so that we can have something finite dimensional on the table. Uh, okay, uh, so we breathe life into quantum systems with the generator of time translations, and that's given by Hamiltonian. A Hamiltonian for us in this talk, Today is a pairwise interacting quantum spin system. So these terms H, J, J plus one, they only act on neighboring lattice cells. J, that's what this, this picture here is meant to indicate. You know, that two, two, uh, these two blobs here inter, uh, is meant to represent the, the, the fact that these two lattice cells interact according to some D by D squared by D squared matrix H, J, J plus one. Really important here is that we allow these interaction terms to depend on the lattice spacing parameter epsilon. This is key. If you don't allow them to run or change with epsilon, then you'll get trivial limits later on. Um, and so what does that deliver us? So we have now a recipe for a sequence of ground states. So every Hamiltonian uh, gives you all kinds of things. It gives you a, the dynamics thanks to the Schrodinger, time-dependent Schrodinger equation. It also gives you the, uh, the, the eigenstates, the statics, and let's just you, you run with that data here. So given this Hamiltonian, we'll, we'll say it's, it get, you, you solve the matrix, you work out its ground state, which gives you a vector. This vector is the ground state ket omega epsilon, but I don't really like ket so much. I prefer tracial states and operator algebra. So I'm gonna insist on calling these, these quantum states omega epsilon, but you should just think of them as the density operator associated to the, the vector, vector state omega epsilon, which is the ground state of this finite dimensional matrix. So with a, a sequence of Hamiltonians, and uh, we get a sequence of ground states that depends on both n, the number of lattice sites, and the lattice spacing epsilon, because we've explicitly allowed that to happen. And what we're going to do just to make life simpler for us, because we're going to be talking about sequences all the time, is we're going to choose a dyadic sequence of scales. So instead of epsilon being like totally arbitrary, we're just going to imagine that the lattice system we have always has a power of two number of lattice sites. That's not necessary, but it just makes life sort of simpler for the presentation. So we'll introduce a slightly different notation. Um, H naught epsilon superscript N means the Hamiltonian for the lattice system with lattice spacing two to the minus N. Uh, uh, yeah, it just means that. 
good. And big N is like what we'll call the scale now. Little N is the number of lattice sites, big N is the scale. Um, the BSF, um, so my, this Hilbert space and the thermal limit becomes uncountable because its dimension doubles every time you add a qubit. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, I, that, that you're concerned that if I take the limit n goes to infinity, we'll get a, a, um, a, a problematic object in, the, in Hilbert space theory. So like I'm gonna sidestep that. Right, um, even worse than the usual one, because you're doing- yeah, 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 yeah. So we're gonna sidestep that by building an, a sequence of operator algebras. And then we, if you, I, I'll jump ahead and just give you the answer in mathematics words. Um, everything's finite so far. Like I've never let n go to infinity yet. Um, to actually take the limit, you need to talk about operator algebras. And that's the only place where you can get avoid this uncountable Hilbert space. Um, and then you have to use something called the GNS construction to build a separable Hilbert space. Um, I will really be sweeping that detail under the rug, but it does work out. Um, okay. okay, so I want to now sort of summarize the data that we have at hand. Uh, you have a lattice system. It has two to the n plus one lattice sites, according to the scalings that I've chosen. Uh, and associated to each sort of discretization, we have a Hilbert space. The Hilbert space has a differing dimension. This is really important. This is a different Hilbert space to that Hilbert space. That's a different Hilbert space to that Hilbert space, right? This one just has twice or, or D times the number of dimensions of the previous one. So to every scale, there's a different Hilbert space. To every scale, we also have a ground state now. That's sort of data that's given to us from a Hamiltonian. So we have a state associated to the lattice at different discretizations. And so what you should imagine is we've just got this like infinite list of Hilbert spaces and states and lattices. And now the key to the continuum limit, the absolute the crux of the matter is how do we build a convergent sequence? How do we build a limit? What does the word limit mean? And for that, we're gonna to have to really take a um, sidestep uh, uh, this question slightly um, by talking about observables. Um, and that's why we need to do that because to interpret the word continuum limit, we need to compare states at different scales. Uh, that's what, so that we can introduce the notion of a convergent sequence. So before you have a, a method to compare things, you need, uh, before you build the convergent sequence, you need a method to compare things. And so that's what we're gonna spend, dwell on for the next uh, bunch of slides. Okay, and to do that, we're just gonna need a map, right? We need, it, it, there's no magic, uh, magical all fit, all size fits all solution to this problem. I need a way to compare residents of this Hilbert space here in order to talk about a limit or sequence of states. I need a, a way to talk about residents of this Hilbert space with residents of that Hilbert space there. These Hilbert spaces are different dimensions. They, 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 you cannot, they're not even like mathematically formally uh, isomorphic. So we're gonna need a map between them or some kind of map to compare these, these Hilbert spaces. And I have to tell you that although this looks all general and everything, the designing of these maps is the sort of, this is the bread and butter of what physics is about. And so there is no magical axiomatic approach to, to finding these maps either that I'm about to introduce, but we can at least say what properties we need them to have in order to build a continuum limit. So what, are, what am I talking about? I'm talking about maps, right? Maps, and maps on what? Well, maps on states. So we'll work in the Schrodinger picture first and then we'll, bump, we'll, we'll change around and we'll work in the Heisenberg picture. So a map on states, well, states are density operators. So we, need to, we would want our maps to be physical maps. Um, so why not? Um, so let's make them CP maps. So we're, we're gonna talk about or introduce some extra data now. And this is the data of a coarse graining. And the coarse graining is a way of taking a state on a finer lattice and producing from it a state on a coarser lattice. And the purpose of this map is to, to, to declare physically that these represent the same, the same system only at different scales. So that's what E roughly speaking means. It's extra data that we have to build, we have to present in order to build a continuum limit. So all we're gonna assume from now on is that we have this data, we have a way to coarse grain states from finer lattices to, to coarser lattices. And that'll help us to interpret the sentence convergent limit. And so that gives us the, what's called the renormalization group. You've probably heard these words said in a zillion different contexts. This is the context we mean it on in this talk. The renormalization group is a collection of CP maps between Hilbert spaces uh, at different scales. We assume that N2 is bigger than N1, the scale. We go from finer to coarser lattices. And this is presented in the Schrodinger picture. Um, but I prefer actually for various reasons to work in the Heisenberg picture. So we'll just do all of this again in the Heisenberg picture. So in the Heisenberg picture, 
uh, maps act on observables and states stay static. So what are the observables for a lattice system at scale n? Well, it's, you just take the observables for a single lattice site. So here, this is a finite dimensional matrix algebra, it's just matrices with side B, tensor them up, one for each site, and then you have the full observable algebra for the system on n sites. Um, this can be generalized in the case of compact Lie groups to the group algebra LG um, for bosonic systems to L2R. You could you could stick as your uh, the bounded operators on L2R and so on. Blah blah blah. So there's a, you can always build an observable algebra for a lattice system for really a large essentially all the systems that you would encounter in quantum field theory. So I will say the words probably the MD is the observable algebra associated to site or let's say lattice cell. J. And these are the full observables for this system at a given scale. And so now the data of a renormalization group in the Heisenberg picture is a bunch of CP maps. Like CP maps just act dually on op observables as they do on, uh, on states. And so the data of a, C of, of a renormalization group now is just a bunch of CP maps acting on observables, but they act in the opposite direction now. So a a coarse graining on states becomes a fine graining on operators. And that's, that's uh, an important observation to, to keep in mind. So what is a renormalization group? It's a bunch of CP maps acting on observables of lattice systems, obeying some really key physically important uh, axioms. We want that if we fine grain from N1 to N2, and then we fine grain from N2 to N3, that we can as well have just done the, the full fine graining from N1 to N3. So we have this composition property. And also it's kind of, I, I hope it's natural to, to you to assume that if we don't do any fine graining at all, that with this, this RG map should just do the identical. Um, this is the, yep. So if we start with something more fine grained, then we can easily coarse grain by throwing away information. If we That's right, yes. Grained objects and we make it more fine grained, we have to put in information. Where's that information coming from? Aha. Uh -huh. uh, so this is, I, I, when I say fine graining on operators, I, I precisely mean coarse graining on observables, uh, on, on states, sorry. So uh, if you caught, throw away information about from the state, right, you know, you have this fine grained system and then you, you, you do some averaging process and you, you throw that, you do a partial trace to throw out some, some degrees of freedom. That's a coarse graining and, and hopefully that's natural. But in the Heisenberg picture, what you've done is you've said, I've taken, uh, uh, I've got, I'm allowed to do measurements on my finer system using only observables on my coarser system. So the jewel of a coarse graining on states is, is a fine graining on observables. You are still losing information. It's just like the partial trace operation uh, on observables is actually tensoring on an identity yeah, in, a, in the Heisenberg picture. So I'm not actually, I'm doing nothing, nothing here mathematically except taking the jewel uh, of in the Schrodinger picture of a coarse graining in the Heisenberg picture. Okay, thanks. Uh, so these are still coarse gradings in, in the in the Schrodinger picture, in the state picture. Uh, one of these maps here. I said fine. Yeah, okay. I, that was unwise of me. I apologize. Um, I should still use the terminology coarse graining. So even though we're working dually and operators go from like coarser systems to finer systems, really we're doing on the state level, of still doing a coarse, coarse graining in the Heisenberg picture. So the data of, of, of a renormalization group in the Heisenberg picture is a bunch of CP maps with this composition property uh, and this triviality property. And that gives us what's known in the mathematical literature as an inductive system of operator algebra. Which is quite a mouthful. Um, I won't. Uh, we could take a digression here and talk a lot about direct limits of operator algebras. We don't need to. I'm going to save you the pain. Um, we don't quite need that data here today. But be aware that um, this data is precisely what you need to talk about limits of, of operator algebras and thermodynamic limits as well. So the in the, what do we need to build a continuum limit? Well, now I'm going to start listing the data you need to build the continuum limit of a bunch of regulated theories. You're going to need some observables. You're going to need, in the background, of course, you're going to need some lattice systems. And those lattice systems are associ associated to these lattice systems are a bunch of observables. Also, we, uh, 
is, well, directly associated to these lattice systems is also a bunch of Hilbert spaces. And of course, I've assumed that we have some data, some Hamiltonians that, that tell us the right or the same or the roughly equivalent physical system at different scales. So that's a lot of data to assume already. Um, but also, crucially, we assume that's, that we've been very clever or someone's come and told us or we found by discovery process a bunch of these CP maps here that tell us how to coarse grain states between different scales. Given this data, it's now possible to build sequences of states and take their limits into the continuum. And so that's, that's the procedure I want to now describe in the remaining part of this talk. Um, predictably, I won't get to the end of the talk. OK, so let's now, I'll now just sort of show you pictorially what this data gives you and how you build these limits and what is, what is a limit and so on. So the idea is you, you, you have a bunch of, you have a, a bunch of lattice systems with lattice spacings uh, determined by the number of lattice sites. So epsilon is two to the minus n plus one, I think from memory, sorry. And uh, you have the data of a Hamiltonian for each possible discretization at each possible scale. This physicist came along and told you this data. That's what you should think, right? A physicist says, yeah, yeah, I, this is the right Hamiltonian at every scale. I'll tell you how to build it. And then uh, from that data, you can derive the ground state for the system. Just by, you know, we give ourselves the, the magical power of being able to diagonalize this matrix. So, so therefore there is a ground state associated to the system. And here it is as a density operator. And now given that data, we've got also with these coarse grainings, so we can coarse grain that, that initial state omega naught n to build a coarser uh, state. The state is probably going to be mixed. This is very important. These states are not necessarily pure, right? They're often mixed. And so we, we take our original nice fine grained pure state, we coarse grain at one level to get a mixed state. Oh, we can do it again, right? And let's do it again. And so you can repeat this coarse graining to get a tower of coarse grain states for every single lattice spacing determined by a scale n. Now let's take that date, this tower of states and see what we can get from that. And we come to something really uh, crucial in the definition of quantum field theory, and that's so-called Wilson's triangle of renormalization. And the, the key to understanding quantum field theory is this, this diagram that I'm about to build. So you imagine that your, your friendly physicist has handed you uh, these ground states for every possible scale n. And then, um, which is already a big ask, but let's suppose that that, that data is given to us. And often in the quantum field theories that we have, we have this data. Uh, it, I mean, we don't know the actual description of the ground state, but we know the Hamiltonian and we know in principle what the ground state should look like. So for any Lagrangian you can care to write down, this is usually a good guess for, for, for what this omega n should be at, 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 for every n. And then you take, you start coarse graining these states and now you produce new states. These states are now mixed, generally speaking. And now you can, uh, well, uh, you can start looking, you've got two states on each, at each scale now. So we started off with, with one input state at each scale. And now we're all of a sudden we've got two for each scale, right? Because we've got the original ground state, but we've got the coarse grain version of the finer state as well available to us. So we can imagine that this gives us a kind of sequence. And so the beautiful thing about the sequence is that these two objects are comparable. I can compare operationally that state to that state. Uh, that makes sense. I can talk about experiments which distinguish between these two states. They're on the same lattice. But they're naturally and obviously associated with a finer lattice. So you can build this, this sequence of states. It's only got two terms in the sequence. But let's push forward. Let's coarse grain again. And let's produce another term in the sequence, a horizontal sequence here we're building. And what stops us continuing? Well, nothing. As long as we have a prescription for building these uh, ground states at every scale, we can continue to do this forever. And we produce this triangle of coarse grain states and these sequences of states, these horizontal sequences. These are really crucial for understanding the continuum limit. And you can go on forever. Yep. And we can produce, we can imagine the sequence goes on forever. Okay, it's a bit naughty of me to put an infinity down there, um, but I hope you understand. You, you forgive me for what that means. And now I can tell you what is the scaling limit of a quantum spin system or regulated theory. 
it's just that. It's just the limit of this sequence of states. So it's just at a given scale n, there's always this input data of a given scale. We can talk about a, a sequence of states, the density operators, and we can ask if that limit exists. Does the limit exist as m tends to infinity? If yes, then we call that the scaling limit state of the theory. This is uh, not trivial. The existence of this limit is uh, the result of damn hard work rather than uh, uh, mathematical trickery. Uh, and I'll get, I'll get back to this topic uh, later in the talk. Um, don't regard this limit as being easy to, to produce, but if the limit exists and you understand the limit in the sense of the standard topology on density operators on, this, on your finite dimensional lattice system, then you say that that scaling limit exists and that's what it is. And there's a nice property of the, this RG, these scaling limit states are invariant for, uh, under the action of these CP maps. Now, the full continuum limit, if you like, is when you take n to infinity. And uh, that makes sense because of this invariance property here. Uh, and that actually entails no further mathematical proof. The minute you've proved the existence of these thingies, then this limit here is easy to establish. So actually, all the hard work is in this box here in, in, in this talk and in the study of quantum systems in general. That's where you spend 99.9% .9 of all your effort is in this line here. So we've gotten you know, pretty deep into abstract territory. Let's just do a trivial example so you can really sort of center your imagination on, on what this all means. So let's talk about the world's simplest quantum field theory. Uh, the world's simplest quantum field theory is built using this quantum spin system. It's the magnetic field Hamiltonian. So the magnetic field Hamiltonian has a very simple ground state. All the, uh, I should say that we're talking about qubits here on the lattice. So at every lattice, uh, at a lattice scale, we just declare that this is the correct Hamiltonian for the lattice system. And uh, the, that Hamiltonian is this magnetic field Hamiltonian. It doesn't depend on the lattice spacing. It has a trivial dependence on epsilon. And if we do so, then we determine that to every scale of our lattice theory, the ground state of the theory is just the product state with all zeros or the spins pointing up. Um, we need to tell, I didn't give us yet the data of, of the, the CP maps that connect this between the different layers. Let's just do so-called Kadanoff block spin renormalization. What does that mean? It means I flip a coin and I trace out uh, the left side or the right side of a pair of lattice spins. And that's the CP map that does it. So the CP map that does it, alpha n, n plus one, is based on the CP map gamma. This is all in the Heisenberg picture, right? So if you flip a coin and do a trace, partial trace, uh, on, on a bipartite system in the Schrodinger picture, that's the same in the Heisenberg picture as tensoring on I either to the left or the right. And so the CP map that does this change of scale, then this coarse graining is just do this um, blockwise in pairs, just coarse grain by averaging out um, every pair of sites to a bigger site. It's called Kadanoff block spin renormalization. And if you apply that CP map to these ground states in this, you build a Wilson triangle of states and they're all pure actually, all the states in this Wilson triangle are pure. In fact, they're just the product state with all zeros. So in fact, the, the scaling limit is a pure state and it gives, the scaling limit is really easy to write down. It's just the product state of all zeros. And this is the world's simplest quantum field theory. This is a legitimate quantum field theory. Um, it's it's the, the trivial quantum field theory. Um, so this, this all looks, there's this huge disconnect now. I've got this abstract uh, machinery for how we talk about like systems at different scales and what does it mean to take a limit. And on the other hand, a very limited list of examples. Uh, so you might be quite rightly suspicious about all of this. Um, and uh, you should be suspicious until we start presenting examples to you. So the, uh, what, should I, what I should say is at this point is that the existence of these limits is hard to prove. There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? We, we, we don't, no amount of mathematical trickery can make this, this easy. And the limits depend on the Hamiltonians that you stick in as input data. It depends on these CP maps that you choose to do your course grading. Um, however, uh, I can report that so far, the, the current, there's a, list of, a growing list of theories which are now admit uh, an existence in the sense of the, the, the scaling limit that I've, I've given you. Um, and this growing list includes free fermions, free bosons. These are building blocks of the Klein-Gordon field, of uh, the Dirac field. Selected spin systems have now been uh, investigated. Lots of, uh, actually lots of compact 
Uh, lots of Yang Mills theories based on various compact gauge groups have been understood in this limit so far. Unfortunately, not the ones you need to prove this mass gap hypothesis existence and then your math price problem, I don't expect we'll ever be able to do that, uh, or at least not easily. Um, in fact, I'll pause at this moment. You might wonder, well, what do I need to do to prove this mass gap existence millennial math prize problem? Well, you need a Hamiltonian. And indeed, we know which one to write down. It's called the colbert soskin Hamiltonian. We need a bunch of uh, uh, CP maps here. Uh, status unclear. We don't know which ones to write down, or which are the right RG maps for this, uh, this theory. Don't, you know, we've definitely tried, right? Um, and the, also, we're going to need to be able to get these ground states, and that's where the, the whole process is really hard. So in general, it's hard to diagonalize matrices, therefore it's hard to get these states, therefore it's hard to get these, uh, these sequences of states, therefore it's just hard. And that's actually why the, the math, the, this clay math prize problem is hard. It's hard because the Hamiltonian is hard to diagonalize. And it's hard because we don't yet really quite know what's the right set of CP maps for this uh, Yang Mills theory problem. So it's sort of hard for two reasons. But they're, they're, they're physics reasons, I would argue, rather more physics reasons than they are math reasons. Okay, there is a non-trivial example I want to report on. It's You can find that in one of our recent papers. This is a, a XZ type spin system. It turns out to be related to the Dirac quantum field theory in one plus one dimensions. And it's certainly the one that occupied us for a good couple of years recently, because this is a non-trivial conformal field theory. So that's something, a topic I want to jump onto now um, by moving on to the topic of dynamics. So, so far, all I've done is explain to you how to write down a sequence of quantum states and to argue that these states uh, can be built into a, a massage into a, 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 a Cauchy limit a Cauchy sequence for which you can take a limit. Now we want to breathe life into the theory by letting the Hamiltonian run to solve the Schrodinger equation. And for that, we need to solve the dynamics of the theory. And well, let's be ambitious. Let's not just solve the dynamics. Let's just go for the whole thing. Let's just not only look for the Poincaré group. Let's like, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's try and simulate the full conformal group. So the conformal group of symmetries of any theory, um, let's focus on one plus one dimensions for the, for the time being is the group of conformal transformations of Minkowski space. And the, the total dream would be to find a unitary action of this group on our limit sequences. And that would be the full, a full uh, existence of a conformal, mathematical existence of a conformal field theory. Uh, what is this conformal group thingy? Well, per definition, it's this product of groups, the, uh, the group of orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of the circle. Well, that sounds like a mouthful. Um, what's that? Well, this is just reparameterizations of the circle under composition, and you can actually draw elements of this group. So this group isn't uh, that ab abstract. It's really just a bunch of functions that map from the circle to itself, and uh, they preserve orientation and the differentiable and their differentiable inverse. So you can draw them. The elements of diff plus S1, which is the group conform essentially determine the conformal group, are just these nice one functions from the unit integral to themselves. Oh, I just realized I did something really stupid. Um, this is this is a non-example because the derivative of this function doesn't match the derivative of the function here. I'm sorry, this is a this is an element of diff plus the interval. So, uh, because I, I didn't take care to match the actual first derivative of the function at that point to here, because everything's periodic. Uh, sorry about that. Um, okay, now people talk about the conformal group. You know, what has this got to do with the conformal group and conformal transformations? Well, there's a very beautiful construction called the welding construction that uses the uh, Riemann's mapping theorem to argue that every one of these nice one-dimensional reparameterizations corresponds exactly to a conformal transformation of the disk in the complex plane. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these things. So to every conformal mapping of the disk to some odd shape in the complex plane, there's one of these and vice versa. Quite a beautiful piece of complex analysis. So uh, you should in your mind be thinking these things correspond somehow to reparameterizations of this circle. Now, in physics, what we like to do is study things infinitesimally because often that's somehow easier. And uh, by doing so, we introduce something called the Virasoro algebra or width algebra. And that's just 
the space of infinitesimal reparameterizations of the circle. So uh, what's an infinitesimal one? Well, one that's kind of close to the, the, the straight line, right? So there I've drawn the first term in a Taylor series approximation to uh, infinitesimal reparameterization. And uh, we study them under composition. And we tend to write that the non-trivial part of such an infinitesimal diffeomorphism as psi, um, the diffeomorphism, like the, here's a trivial diffeomorphism, right? Fx equals x, that's nothing. And so here's just a little wobble around that. And the, what people call the Verisora algebra is, or, or with algebra, is just the space of these things to first order, well, rather second order um, under composition. And because everything's periodic, right? We're working on a circle. So here's zero, here's two pi. Um, it's really convenient to use a Fourier series to express this function psi x, which determines our infinitesimal reparameterization um, in terms of its Fourier coefficients. So it's very convenient to do that. Um, and then I can now tell you uh, what the ultimate goal is here. The ultimate goal is to take this group of things or this algebra of things, these infinitesimal reparameterizations, and find a way to get them to act unitarily on our Hilbert space that we built in the previous part of the talk. And what does that mean? Well, it means there must be a way, a, a map U, that takes one of these, these reparameterizations here and produces a quantum operator acting on our Hilbert space H. And here's the actual expression that you will see in the literature for that quantum operator. You see these L hats. These L hats are generated, they're, they're Hermitian, not quite Hermitian operators. They're, they're operators on H uh, that are corresponding to these infinitesimal Fourier wiggles. And they are uh, determining these Ls is equivalent to understanding the full action of the conformal group and thereby the Poincaré group on, on, your, on your system. And these Ls, they, you can argue that they obey uh, some commutation relations, and here they are. This is the famous Virasora algebra. Um, when we allow this, this action to be projective, so you allow them to act not only as unitaries, but unitaries up to a phase, then you have a group co-cycle, blah, 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 and you end up with a uh, slightly extended algebra of uh, these operators here. This is the wit algebra here, this stuff I've drawn in, in this red box here, and this additional bit here is due to the fact that we allow a, project, a representation to be projected. Now, that's highly kind of abstract, right? I, it, you'd be forgiven for thinking there's not a lot of physics going on here um, because I didn't mention that Hamiltonians or lattice systems or anything, right? But now I'm going to explain a connection which you don't often find in the literature between these Virasora algebra elements and some real physics. And I find this, 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 this explanation infinitely more helpful than the one I just gave. And it's to do with non-uniform Hamiltonians. So imagine, if you will, that, that our system, that we have a continuum system, just so I can talk these words. Um, you, 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 then you can write your Hamiltonian as, like a, as, a, a, as an integral over a Hamilton density. And th that's something that you could imagine. And then you, you imagine, okay, now I want to ask the question, what happens if I have a non-uniform Hamilton? What happens if I introduce some variation or modulation here, V? V is like uh, uh, a penalty function or, uh, you know, V is some, some, some number at every position on the circle. Then what I'd be doing is I'd be allowing time to run at different speeds depending on where you are. That's what I would be doing. This is a lapse function, a delay function v. So if v is one everywhere, then time marches forward at an equal speed all around this system. But if I allow v to be non-trivial, then in some parts of the, the system, time runs faster than in other parts. But if you think about it, and if you think about what a boost is or a rotation is in quantum mechanics, like a boost in particular, what is that? Well, that's when you let the clocks run faster the further away they are. So this is actually the physically the right way to implement a boost. And also, if we introduce a momentum operator, the right way to introduce a rotation. So a rotation is a rotation is a, a space-dependent translation. A boost is a space-dependent time translation. And I find that an infinitely more natural thing to think about in terms of physical systems. And it turns out that this, this connection isn't just some hand-wavy um, uh, thing. There is a direct connection between these the modulations of Hamiltonians and these Virasoro or diffeomorphisms I was talking about earlier. 
So to see that connection, we, we, we take these Fourier weighted Hamiltonian densities. Um, okay, these aren't Hermitian any longer, but you can build Hermitian objects from them. And it turns out that these H Fourier modes are exactly these Virasora algebra elements. So really, uh, the, the name of the game is, my time is almost up. The name of the game is to uh, simulate non-uniform Hamiltonian. So whenever anyone says Virasoro conformal, blah, 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 what you should be thinking is that we're simulating the result of the Schrodinger equ equation applied to a non-uniform Hamiltonian density. Um, what's the simplest non-uniform Hamiltonian density? Well, the one that does nothing, uh, the one where the uniform the, the Hamiltonian density is uniform, that's a shift, a shift in time. So that's the same as solving the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and that corresponds to the so-called Virasora algebra element L0. And the problem, therefore, now is to, uh, is to get this bunch of things to act on our lattices that I talked about in the first part of the talk. But I hope this, pro this problem is fairly obvious. This thing is incompatible with the lattice discretization, right? A diffeomorphism is going to shrink and expand lattice cells. It, it, you'll get a non-uniform lattice at the end of it. Um, well, we can sidestep all of this. I spent several years worrying about this, but in the end, um, the, the moral is don't worry about it. Just uh, interpret the Virasora algebra, the conformal group and so on as a non-uniform Hamiltonian. So you build these Hamiltonians densities. This is the original Hamiltonian density for our problem and you modulate it by some Fourier mode. You build these new Fourier weighted Hamiltonian objects and those things pretty much contain um, all the Virasora algebra as linear combinations. Is that a, so that's the, where there's no like x in the exponent. Can there be a sum? H oh gosh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a problem. Thank you that you, you, you caught a bug. That is not an x. That's a j. Thanks. Um, so the the trick is to simulate the dynamic to solve the Schrödinger equation uh, for these these objects here h k n. Okay, they're not Hermitian. So, but you can get away with this by taking real and imaginary parts. Uh, so the, the, the objective is to simulate the action of these on our discrete lattice systems. And that is where the last part of the hard work goes into to proving or to simulating a quantum field theory. We need to start with the data that I told you before, the continuum limit data. We need to find some appropriate renormalization group maps. And now we need to simulate this action here, the action in the Heisenberg picture of these dynamics due to these Hamiltonian modes or the LK modes. And then we produce a sequence of states and we take their limit and then we get an action of this thing in the limit. So uh, I'm gonna to effectively end the talk here by saying that this uh, is, will also deliver a quantum simulation algorithm because all you have to do is stop at some given N at some given scale and if you've done the limit process correctly, then you'll actually have a bound on the distance from your predictions to the continuum limit object. But that really takes us into several other talks. So I want to pause here and sort of effectively end the talk here and summarize by saying the, the key take home message is that to understand quantum fields, we have to understand sequences of quantum spin systems. And to understand sequences, we need to compare quantum spin systems of different scales. And when you do that, you get a, a, a sequence of states and you can talk about the limit of the sequence of states. And that's what we would call the continuum limit. Before I fully end my talk, I just want to make a brief advertisement. Um, if you're looking for a challenge, if you're looking for an interesting opportunity uh, in the you know, coming years, if you're coming to the end of your studies and you're thinking that Europe might supply new and interesting challenges for you, then I would ask you to consider Germany as a, as a target for your future career. Um, here, the landscape is extremely exciting in the quantum, quantum computer technology um, uh, framework because the, uh, the German government has just recently invested 2 billion euros in the development of quantum computer technology, which includes quantum uh, theory uh, through, to, through to implementations. And we are very lucky here in Niedersachsen to have benefited from some of this investment and, but uh, not exclusively. And there are plenty of ex extraordinary opportunities to be found. So keep a lookout. There'll be lots and lots of positions advertised in the next couple of months in Germany. Um, but now let me fully finish my talk by summary, summarizing the three key points. Firstly, uh, you should understand the kinematics of a quantum field theory 
via the circular operator algebraic renormalization. I discussed the simulation of dynamics by working at the projective unitary action of the conformal group. And I explained very briefly how you realize that on the lattice by the so-called Kuhn-Seller formula. Now I really am done. Thank you very much. Unmute and uh, clap. Thanks for a great talk. I wish we had more time. Um, these, uh, just real quick, the, on 2D, do, do they have this Kusalur uh, thing uh, for, for like higher dimensions? Uh, um, it's, that was it's, a problem in lattice gauge theory. Yeah, it's actually not very hard to imagine what it is. I mean, so firstly, the, 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 the conformal group is pretty boring in two plus one dimensions and higher. The conformal group only includes uh, scaling and special conformal transformation. So it's not this beautiful infinite dimensional group that you have in one plus one dimensions. In higher dimensions, it's basically the Poincare group with scalings. And so, yeah, there is a Kusala formula in, in higher dimensions. It's not very oh. difficult to imagine. You just have space dependent um, Hamiltonians. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's uh, more. Yes, Subai. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. I, I had a question. Uh, so you mentioned that the, the, the challenge for simulation would be to identify these uh, ground states and 